Hi, everyone. Welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where my awesome co host, epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens, and I speak with people from all walks of the publishing industry. Lurking for Legends is a live interactive broadcast, and we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or simply make comments on what they hear in the show. So tonight we have David M. Kelly, a sci fi author and book Hello. cover artist. Yes, he makes all of those amazing covers on his own from scratch, really. I mean, that amazes me. So welcome, David. How are you tonight? I'm great, thank you, Christy. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, it's great to have you here. And you've got a number of books and short stories out there for us to talk about too. So tell us, just start out by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you write in general. Um, I'm a, a displaced person, originally from England. Uh, I now live in Canada. Uh, they kicked me out of England, so I kind of had to find some place, you know. Um, basically, I write sci-fi, which most of it is kind of um, hard sci-fi. Um, so my ear police is bothering me. <laughs> I'm not used to wearing this. Um, so, yeah, I usually uh, write um, hard sci-fi uh, with plausible science, although my last novel, uh, Hyperia Jones was completely non-realistic science. It was just completely goofy sort of fun, uh, which was uh, just to, for me to have a change. Um, and usually the kind of uh, fast paced, lots of action, and up to now at least kind of relatively near future. They're, they're all set about 150 years in the future sort of thing, so it's not kind of way off in the sort of very distant kind of like uh, future times. Mm, cool. And of course, like when something is close enough, um, science wise or futuristic wise, it's all the more interesting to me, at least, because I can kind of foresee that stuff happening and look at how it might happen. And I, yeah. I really enjoy that kind of stuff a lot. That's some of my favorite kind of sci fi. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of the reason why I kind of decided to go that way, because uh, I wanted people to still be able to kind of like relate to it and understand kind of things that were going on and how they kind of relate to what we're seeing around us in the world today sort of thing. Um, the whole plan is really to, it's a big kind of like giant universe which will develop over time and go more and more into the future with different characters and different books and different series. So uh, yeah, I will get there, but it will take quite a few books. <laughs> So before we get into uh, the, the series, the Joe Ballon series and the, the Logan spinoff series that's coming off that, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Hyperion Jones and the Olive Branch Caper? Because that is, like you were mentioning, a total takeoff from what you normally write. It's kind of a, like a fun, futuristic uh, wrestling novel, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah, it, uh, I'd kind of done two, uh, two novels back to back, which were quite sort of seri serious and quite emotional for me, the, the third Joe Ballen book and, and then the first of the Logan series. And I really just wanted something that was a complete break that I didn't really have to kind of like get quite so emotionally involved with. Um, and I came up with this idea for this uh, character, Hyperia Jones, and she's um, she's basically a scepter point. So she's like kind of like she's a humanoid, but uh, derived from Kind of like an octopus type creature so she's got sort of like tentacles on her head and all this kind of stuff and basically um during the day she's a pro wrestler in this kind of three-dimensional wrestling kind of league and then at night secretly she's a jewel thief and goes around uh stealing jewels <laughs> to order and I just kind of like thought that was just such a kind of like a, a weird sort of like wacky idea. And I just thought I've got to run with that. And so that's how it came about. And uh, I wrote the first book. Um, so, yeah, that was how it came out. Oops. Lost it again. <laughs> so it's been there plague me all night. <laughs> if, if you got a sequel plan for the Hyperion Jones, is that one? Is it that one just a fun one off? No, there will be. I, I've actually, uh, while I was editing it, I came up with so many ideas for future stories with that character. Um, I've probably kind of like already outlined um, probably about six or seven different books that I could do with that character or that group of characters. So, uh, so, 
So our favorite CJ <laughs> has commented, "Hi CJ," and she says, "The great uh, the great ideas in your books must be a lot of research." Um, for Hyperia Jones, no. <laughs> <laughs> I so that was just, totally just just you having fun. Like there wasn't even research involved in that one. No, I just kind of oh. um, literally winged the whole book. It's like I I didn't stop, kind of like even to take a breath. Really, um, the Joe Ballon series uh, and the Logan series they're very much kind of like um, as far as I can base them kind of like in reality and in sort of like uh, real physics and real science. And so there's a lot of this associated research with those. It's like sometimes I'll research things for, you know, kind of like a few hours and that translates into a book and it might be just kind of like two words, you know, so, but it's, but it's the right words. That's the point, you know, sort of thing. So yeah, there is a lot involved with those. Yeah, I can imagine because like um, it's the same kind of thing with historical fiction as you know, you, you do all that mm -hmm. research for just a couple of words. So I totally relate to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> CG also says, I love the background image. Is, do you actually did you do that one as well? The one in the background? And she says, yeah. do you do your own designs? We know you do your own designs. You mentioned that uh, uh, they look fantastic, but uh, that, I imagine there's a lot of work that goes into your covers. Um. Yeah. And. I'm not very quick <laughs> when it comes to that kind of stuff, um, and certainly I was very, very slow on the on the first couple I, I tried to do, uh, and there are multiple versions that will never see the light of day because they were so horribly bad. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I do. Oh, I have up to now done all of the covers on all of my books and like the ships and everything. It's all my own designs. Um, Many, many years ago in a past life, I worked for a games company. And uh, at that time, when you worked for a games company, you kind of did a bit of everything. It wasn't just, it wasn't like now where it's kind of like all specialized. You kind of like, you did like programming, you do some graphics and so on. And so I picked up some uh, 3D modeling skills with that. And so when I came to doing the, uh, the first cover for, for well, it was actually my short story collection. Um, I kind of like I looked around and I saw the price of covers and I thought, well, I'll see if I can avoid paying that <laughs> because I don't want to like sound cheap. <laughs> and so I thought, well, yeah, I'll see what I can do. And if I'm happy with it, it's like I'll go with it. If I'm not, I'll I can just like get somebody else's design, you know. And as it turned out, I kind of like felt, yeah, I'm kind of like okay with that. Um, and I've been kind of like managing ever since. I, I kind of always sort of wonder if it's going to get to a point where I think I just can't manage the cover for this book. But so far, I've kind of like managed to carry on doing them. I kind of can't imagine what you couldn't handle because, you know, what you, what you do with like, you know, not only the space background and the, sh the ships, the details in the ships is sort of, uh, expecting you to say something about, um, oh, I should take an overlay or something from somewhere else. But I mean, that is a lot of detail work. I can't even imagine. That's a lot of patience too. A lot of patience to do that. It is. It's very, 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 very detail oriented. And, and it is a lot of work to build up all that detail. I've learned some shortcuts kind of more recently, which help, but it's still a lot of work for sure. And that's why I don't, um, kind of like offer myself as, as services for doing that because with writing I, and, and everything and doing my own, I just don't have the time to actually, you know, kind of put that work into kind of like do codes for somebody else, you know. can imagine. Yeah, that would be quite a lot to do. I mean, just creating some kind of short story cover for me, not doing sci-fi and not doing it from scratch or anything is like, that's enough time for me. <laughs> and you're yeah. doing all of that from scratch. So it's, I can imagine that would be a full-time job if you did it for other people. For sure, yeah, yeah. For sure, yeah. it would have to be. Yeah, I, I use a DAS rendering program and that takes a while and, you know, that's all done for me. I just have to throw the images in there and kind of manipulate them a little bit and then hit render and 
wait for my computer to render them, which takes a while sometimes. But uh, you do everything from scratch, so I couldn't imagine doing that. So it looks like CJ's got another question here. She, and this is something I wanted to ask you as well. Is, uh, she says, your ideas are awesome. She said, what made you want to write in the sci-fi genre in the first place? Was it a certain author? Um, that really kind of came about um, originally with the, uh, the Apollo moon landing. Um, when I was kind of like, well, I'm not going to specify my age. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was a kid, it's like I saw the, uh, the first moon landing. That um, narrows down pretty good then. And I was uh, so kind of like transfixed by that event. Um, like my parents allowed me to stay up late, especially to, to see it and everything. And that kind of like made me really sort of love sort of science and space. And I mean, I was space crazy sort of thing. Um, and that led me kind of like into sort of things like uh, science and technology in terms of my education and so on. And almost kind of like naturally, I started reading science fiction, you know, which is kind of like science, but fictionalized. So, um, and so I read uh, an awful lot of science fiction um, when I was younger. Um, I read almost everything by people like Asimov, Heinlein, um, and uh, Clark, another one. And... Uh, so that kind of like was what I really liked reading about. And so when I decided to start writing, I just, it was just like, it seemed like the natural thing to go, to go with, you know, was like science fiction. That was really what I wanted to do. I tried to make the, the stories themselves almost so that they could be in any setting with, in terms of the story and the characters. But I liked the fact that they're in that science fiction background which kind of like puts characters in, in situations that really are very different to what we kind of like normally know. And uh, so I say it was kind of like <laughs> so this earpiece. I'm telling you, it's driving me nuts. Um, so yeah, the uh, it just seemed as uh, the natural genre from everything that I liked reading. I was a big Star Trek fan as well. Yeah, before yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I've read the Joe Balance series and I loved it. I've read the first book in the Logan series, and uh, the Joe Balance series is really neat because it takes starts in Baltimore, futuristic Baltimore, and Baltimore is pretty mm. well mostly underwater, partly underwater. You can correct me there yeah. if I'm wrong, but uh, it, it takes place, like you say, about 150 years in the future. Yeah, you get some interesting characters there with the the genetics and everything else that's going on with the the uh, the prosthetics and everything else that's going on, especially with Joe Ballin. and his uh, his love interest is a very uh, interesting person as well. So that is kind of a neat twist in the story. Uh, Dolly yeah. is quite an interesting character. But uh, tell us a little bit about the Joe Ballin series. And apparently, you're you're right now you're working on Ballin Four, and you told me that that'll be the last book in the Joe Ballin series itself. And then yeah, to yeah. Shed it to, Logan, yeah. So let us know a little bit about the Joe Ballin series. Um, so the Joe Ballin series. I mean, I again, it was this kind of thing. I, I wanted to do something that was kind of real and based in reality, but futuristic. Um, and I didn't want to do any kind of uh, superhero or, you know, kind of like the chosen one and that kind of theme that seems to be done a lot. Um, and I wanted this guy who was really quite ordinary in most respects. And so, like, this guy is just uh, basically a, an engineer, although he works in space. And in the first book, he... Uh, He's actually had an accident and he's now working on earth driving cabs because he lost both his legs and an arm in an accident in space. He's had them regenerated, so like he's now got all his limbs again, but they're not actually very strong. They're not he's not kind of like, you know, sort of a, a superhero, superman type. Um, he's kind of relatively weak, you know, sort of thing. Um, and basically the the first book is all about a conspiracy to uh, uh, surrounding uh, a prototype spaceship that will be able to take 
like people to other planets and other solar systems uh and he kind of like gets dragged in in a very kind of you know sort of classical sort of noir sense you know he just kind of like picks up this passenger who gets talking to the passenger and then suddenly oh the passenger's been thrown off the top of a building <laughs> you know so uh it was very much that and originally it was planned as um uh, as a single book I, I wasn't planning a series and then as i was editing the first book it's like i suddenly started having all these ideas for like a follow-up book so i thought okay well i'll write a second book uh so the second book is more kind of based in space um and again i i thought i'd only do the one that one book you know well now two books but then again, as I was editing it, I kind of like start having ideas for a third book. Um, so I started writing that and I was actually about 70,000 words into writing the third book. And then after discussions with my wife over the ending on the second book, uh, decided to change the ending on the, the second book, which completely destroyed the 70,000 words that I'd written for the third book. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to rework the whole book, uh, but it was the right decision in the end. I'm glad, you know, I, I was kind of like pleased that that was how it went. And you're um, still married. Sorry? You're still married? Uh, I am, although at the end of um, book four, um, I <laughs> kind of like, when my wife read it again, it's like, I, I swear to God, she was on the verge of divorcing me. Uh -oh. so, uh, yeah, but then, yeah, now I, I've, I'm on the verge of bringing out book four, and it will be the last Balan book, at least for a while, anyway. Is it the last because of the possible divorce, or is it, is it because <laughs> of my ideas? No, I, I think um, we've worked past the possible divorce. Uh, so it's not, I don't think it's, it's that's the reason. It's just, I kind of, I've, done a lot of them yeah I mean this is the fourth one and they are quite difficult to write um, I find them quite difficult emotionally to write as well because they're, they're quite tense and uh, and I and I, and there are other things I want to do um, you know other things I want to write in this kind of same universe I need some tips for this year um, <laughs> But so it's like I just want to kind of like do something a little bit different and and kind of like move the the stories on a little bit more. So I'll be I've, I'm kind of very near to the end of uh, the second in the Logan series. Uh, I'll also be doing some more, as I said, on the uh, Hyperion Jones series. But after that, there's kind of like more things that I want to do, just generally. Yeah. So. I'm just going to interrupt here with the, we got a couple of viewers that are asking some questions here. J.D. Estrada, I said, David, uh, I'm going to put his two questions together here. So maybe I think they go together almost. David, what are some tropes you enjoy flipping on their head? And then uh, also uh, your favorite intergalactic concept to explore. I'm not sure if you can put them two together, answer them separately, whatever, but uh, those are interesting questions. Um, in terms of tropes, quite frankly, I... Um, I enjoy flipping them all. <laughs> it's like if I can figure a way of flipping a, a trope, I, I'll I will flip it. Um, the whole Joe Ballen sort of series is based around that idea. It's like as I said, the hero is um, is very much a, a very vulnerable character. He's not kind of like some Superman. The only thing he's got really is he's incredibly stubborn, and he's got a big mouth. That's it. He's cocky. Uh, He's very cocky. Yeah. You know, uh, which I think he inherited from his father. Um, and the author. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, things like that, I, I like to uh, I like to change around. Um, like you said, the character of Dolly, it's like she's kind of like the love interest, but she's very, very much an unconventional love interest. Uh, and especially, I mean, especially when I first started writing it, I mean, like, there was no characters like that whatsoever that I kind of like was seeing. And, and 
and the whole idea of putting Dolly as she is, kind of like with, kind of like uh, with, um, with Joe, to me was just kind of like a really nice kind of like you know wow that's kind of how would you deal with that kind of as you know just as a person how would you deal with that kind of thing and mm -hmm. being in, in sort of you know being infatuated or in love whatever you want to say you know with this character who is kind of like so different and so unconventional um so yeah i mean the same thing really with the with the logan series um uh logan's basically uh first nations native america um and uh, you know you don't see that many stories involving those kind of characters and i just thought again it was kind of like something that was really nice to kind of like throw in and and sort of like change that kind of narrative a little bit mm -hmm. um, um hyperia jones that kind of like just you know kind of like makes fun out of everything there's a lot of star wars references in that oh well there you go <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm converting you. I'm, I'm turning you over to the dark side. That's it. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but uh, I wore this shirt for David. We always have a we always have a no! fun debate. We, we always have a fun debate when we get together uh, at book shows about Star Wars, and uh, David is not. Uh, he's more of a Star Trek fan. So I brought my yeah. buddy here today just to set you straight. Excellent. <laughs> Yes, because I brought a buddy of my own. Oh no, I, I kind of figured you might. That's why I wanted to be prepared. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was that Imperial, that's an Imperial cruiser. See, yeah. I have switched you over, but I didn't finish there. You see. Uh oh. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's it. I, I can I can just predict what's about what's about to happen right now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see them on your table next book show we do together. I'm gonna to sell them off for, for charity. Oh, yeah. stunning, stunning <laughs> model, you know. <laughs> so if you put them so on your table and you say that, go ahead, Christy. I was just going to say, if you put them on your table and you say, these are absolutely not for sale, people will be desperate to buy them for anything. You <laughs> exactly, yes. Quite possibly, yeah. Collector's <laughs> items, for sure. sure. So, so you were going on about uh, the Joe Balance series, and Logan is a spinoff of that series. Yeah. So it, he's an Aboriginal uh, uh, Native American story. Uh, it, now, is that something that, you had in mind right from the start, or is that something where the character just kind of grew on you as you're writing the Joe Ballin series? Because Logan is mentioned in all the first Joe, like all the Joe Ballin books. Yeah, uh, Logan, um, Logan is kind of like Joe's best friend. Mm -hmm. um, and I originally introduced him because I, I wanted somebody uh, other than Joe who was kind of an engineer uh, in space. and when I was thinking about what kind of people might do that, I, uh, again, it was kind of like, you know, part of this crazy research that sometimes you do. I uh, was reading about how a lot of um, First Nations people um, were responsible for doing all the high rise building projects in New York. And I just thought, you know, like when you kind of like read some of the things that they were doing, I was thinking, you know, what kind of people would want to sort of like work in space in this ultra dangerous kind of like ultra risky environment. And I just remembered the these characters that I'd been reading about. And I thought that would be a really good kind of character to have in the series. Um, so I brought him in in that, um, in that series and Initially, he was just kind of Joe's friend, and that was it. Although he does have a, a key part to play in, in several places in the book, uh, in books, should I say. Um, but then at the end of the third book, yeah, the third of the Joe Ballon series, um, 
I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but um, there's this event that happens where Le Logan is absolutely key to this particular event. And that just kind of like started playing on my mind. And I thought, you know, it's like I need to like do something with this character. So I kind of like originally was going to do uh, just one spin off with Logan. Um, which is the book that's already been published. Um, but again, it's like I, I tend to write very kind of um, uh, spontaneously. Uh, so as I was kind of like working on, on Logan, it's like I kind of like thought, yeah, there's more to this story than there really is in this one book. And so I kind of like decided sort of relatively early on in that one that I was going to do a, a trilogy. Um, so I say I'm working on the second book of that now, but I, I love Logan. The, he's he's very much different to Joe. He, he's similar in a lot of ways, but he's like he's where Joe is kind of like really loudmouth and brash. It's like Logan's kind of like a lot quieter and and um, and he, his humor is uh, very much kind of drier, you know. He, he's not very, he doesn't say a lot, but when he does, it means something kind of thing. I find that Logan to me strikes me as a, as a silent type of a leader. Like, you know, people respect him as a leader, what he does. Whereas Joe Ballum was kind of an anti hero. He's like a reluctant hero. He really doesn't want to be doing what he's doing. And mm. I know his, his, his love interest with Dolly kind of like she's the strong person in that relationship. She strong arms him. Uh, she, you know, she's she's the boss in that relationship. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Joe, Joe just kind of he just kind of bumps around through life, uh, probably because of what happened to him on the high rig out in space. You know, I mm -hmm. think he's kind of given up on everything that's going on. He seemed to it, to me he seemed like an antihero. Yeah. I had a, a review from uh, a German reader, and in the review, I can't remember exactly what it said, but it said. Um, the hero in this book is no hero. And I just thought, yeah, that kind of says it all. Really, mm -hmm. you know, he's not really a hero, isn't he? No. He's kind of he doesn't want to be. He never kind of like wanted to be in that position. He just kind of like keeps ending up in mm -hmm. these positions and and being forced into it, you know. And then he reacts to that. As, speaking of heroes, and I just to jump back into our debate that we always have going on. Uh, out of all the Star Wars movies, this guy is the true hero. Without him, nothing would have ever happened. <laughs> this is actually a 1977 collectible. He, he makes a little beep beep sound with a spin of his head. But... I always thought it was a garbage can myself. He is, that, but that's when his <laughs> when career went down the tubes, he turned into a garbage can. But uh, when he was in his prime, he was a major motion picture star. <laughs> Yes. So, David, um, in terms of w getting back to some of like the um, science research you do when you're writing, because of course this is also fiction and it's meant to be enjoyable. But of course, as you said, you have to do so much research and integrate it in a way that sort of works toward the enjoyment of the story, but uh -huh. also makes it real. Is there anything? Is there any such thing as being too nitpicky? Like when you're writing it, when you're inserting all these details, have you ever gotten caught up in research trying to make something like um, dead on or, or believable or something and then said, it doesn't matter. Like it, it just doesn't matter. Nobody's even gonna know or anything like that. Um, yeah, I've done that. I, in fact, I do that quite a bit. <laughs> Actually, I get caught up in the research and yeah. And I'll kind of like I'll I'll start writing. Sometimes I'll start writing a lot of it into the book, and then usually when I'm kind of like in the editing process, I'll just kind of trim a lot of that back because it's not really necessary. It's like at the end of the day, um, I believe in you know kind of like having a good story, and you know you don't want sort of you know kind of crazy detail to get sort of like in the way of 
that story, you know, and, and developing the characters. Um, so I, I'll be basically, um, I'll usually when I'm kind of like doing a first edit, I'll probably sort of like kind of tend to throw sort of everything in, and then I tend to kind of like cut it back and very much minimize things so that um, there may be still little elements of that in there, but they're not kind of like so big that they're distracting from the main story and um, the main kind of like development that's going on. Oops, excuse me. <coughs> um, so, uh, yeah, but I mean, I, I definitely kind of have a tendency to do that. Um, sometimes my wife, when she, she reads something, she'll kind of like go, I didn't understand the word of that. So, you know, you might want to look at it again. <laughs> and, yeah, so I usually do. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's certainly, you know, because I mean, I, I just love all this kind of geeky stuff, you know, I mean, it's like, I, I just can't like, read it just for, for fun because I enjoy it. But, uh, you know, it's different when, you know, you have to kind of bear in mind what the reader is going to enjoy kind of like reading, you know, that's the main thing. Um, I read something in, uh, a book by James Scott Bell, who does a lot of uh, books on uh, the craft of writing, and he uh, came up with something which I kind of grabbed hold of, and I thought that was a really good piece of advice. He said, you know, don't bother telling the reader anything that they don't need to know, and don't tell them it before they need to know it, you know. Uh, and I tried to follow that advice, you know. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, going on advice and that, uh, I know uh, your wife, Hillary, uh, she's your biggest supporter. How much influence does she have in your books? I, I know she's, uh, she's probably your first reader, and she's probably one of your last readers before you go to publication, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Uh, how much influence does she have? I know she. you told us about the influence she had on uh, telling you that uh, that 70,000 words that you wrote. Oh, no, it was the ending of book two. She didn't like, so you had to change mm -hmm. the thousand words in book three but other than that so what kind of influence does she have is, is the editing influence she works in a library does that seem to help out the the relationship between you two uh, professionally uh she's she's very very important she's very critical um she well she as, as i said she changed um the ending of of the second book um quite dramatically um she, as I said, she had a very bad reaction to the ending of the fourth book <laughs> as well. So I've actually slightly changed the ending with that. Um, she's got a very, very good instinct for um, the sort of mechanics of what a story should be and what makes it satisfy um, to a reader. You know, she reads a lot uh, just in herself, not particularly science fiction, but she reads mm -hmm. a lot just generally sort of thing. Um, and as I said, she's got a very good instinct. And it's like sometimes I think, certainly me as an author, maybe other people, I don't know, but we sort of like tend to get a little bit kind of obsessive in terms of what we think is right. And we don't necessarily always kind of like see things in a sort of broader context of what sort of like a reader may necessarily kind of see. Um, and so she's kind of like a really good sort of, um, sort of um, reality check in terms of what kind of like a reader might expect uh, and, and what might, you know, what they don't expect sort of thing. Um, so yeah, she she's absolutely invaluable. Uh, the fact that she's a librarian, um, it certainly helps because I mean she's very very familiar with books. Um, she's very familiar with um, bookish things in general. Uh, her spelling is much much better than mine. <laughs> um, Thank God for Microsoft Word spell check. Yeah. <laughs> As CJ's mentioning, it's great you both work so well together to get the best of your books out there. 
and uh, yeah, it's it is very much a, a a partnership for sure. I think Margaret Bernard is asking uh, if Hillary is a tourist. A tourist? No, no. A tourist. Not tourist <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't tell you because I, I couldn't tell you what a tourist is actually. Um, Fred, so, sorry. I think that's May to June, I believe. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I know who I am, but uh, and if my sister, I think, is the tourist. So that's April is like, included. June, April. No, she's not. Oh, April to April to May, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Pisces, Aries, Taurus. I know those. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't well, know. No, she's she's not. Right. But. <laughs> so, so, David, is there any is there anything um, in sci-fi in general? Uh, not necessarily in your books, obviously you're going to write what you think is entertaining both for yourself and for your readers, but like in other sci-fi books that you've read, is there anything you're kind of like sick of seeing in any way? Is there anything you're kind of like, no more, stop, <laughs> don't do this anymore, it's overdone or anything like that? Um, I'm kind of sick of superheroes. Um, I mean, I don't particularly consider superhero stuff science fiction anyway, even though it seems to get jammed in there nowadays. Uh, but I'm kind of sort of sick of that. I mean, it's like, you know, we've had so many of them now. It's like, you know, yeah, please. You know, it's like, oh, it's another person who's been bitten by a radioactive canary or something. You know, it's like, you know, who cares, you know. Um, and the whole kind of, um, I think the whole kind of chosen one um, idea is kind of like very, very much overdone these days. Um, again, it's my personal preference, but it's like I prefer people, you know, stories about people who are just kind of like ordinary people who would then get put into kind of like very unusual circumstances. I think that's kind of far more interesting than, you know, having somebody who's kind of like some kind of like weird sort of like, oh, well, I'm a god in reality and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, I think there's a lot of, because of the the, the strength of uh, a lot of the kind of major franchises that we have, I think there's a lot of stories which just kind of like really are just very generic um, kind of copies of those kind of big franchises. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of almost wish all of those big franchise things would just kind of like go away and, and do something else, quite honestly. Um, I mean, you know, you see so many books which are basically just kind of, you know, clones of Star Wars, clones of Star Trek, you know, Terminator clones, you know, Predator clones. It's like, it, you know, all of those kind of franchises all kind of came originally from people taking risks. And now people are just copying them. And they're not taking risks, and and that to me, I think, it is really quite sad and and disappointing. You know, it's like you know, we should all be trying to find our own stories, and not just trying to copy other people's. I couldn't agree with you more. I I so agree with you. What a great mm -hmm. point. Exactly. I definitely also want to hear more news stories and the and the idea, like different takes and stuff. And you know, the idea with mm -hmm. Joe Allen that he is not perfect and he doesn't have any easy time and he didn't have mm -hmm. you know. Of course, when you hear he regenerates, you know, any part of his body, you would assume naturally because that's the cliche that it would be. Um, better than the last one, or it would be the same, or you know something mm. like that. And the fact that it's actually a weakness, I mm. love that automatically. Um, it's something different, and I like that a lot. It certainly allows the reader to cheer for the underdog. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely. Margaret, Margaret Pinard's got a, a good idea for your next book, Dave. Uh, <laughs> maybe put this in the Hypernia Jones category of a radioactive, radioactive. Ra I can't even say that word. It's got more than three syllables. But the radioactive canary superhero would have to save someone in the Yorkshire mine. <laughs> So yeah, <laughs> you must. You must you run that by Hillary first before you start that. I think. <laughs> yeah. J.D. Estrada saying, "I think that's a reflection of the top forty in the pop music when you were talking about uh, all these clone uh, movies that we see from Marvel and uh, all those other ones. You know, they're great. The first fifty of them were great, but after that, they just seem to be the same movie again, and again, and again. It's just different 
special effects in the background. Yeah, and some of them, I mean, literally, they just make the same movie. It's like, I mean, how many times have we seen, like, you know, the birth of Batman? The Spider-Man. How, mm -hmm. how many times have we seen Spider-Man? You know, and, but it's not this. It's not like a continuation of the Spider-Man story. It's the same yeah. story all over again. Like we keep seeing this guy getting bit by a radioactive spider. I wonder how he got his powers. Oh yeah, he got bitten by a spider. <laughs> yeah. Every movie, like, come on, we know that. We knew that a hundred yeah. years ago or fifty years ago, whenever it came out. Like, and it's like, how many it, times does Uncle Ben different. have to die? Yeah. No, I totally agree. Well, I know. Sure. But it, it's selling, so obviously, yeah. obviously people like it. But it's so strange. It's like it's so strange because um, obviously the comic series, there are multiple comic series of Spider-Man and, and it, you know, even the originals and stuff go on for such a long time with very, very different issues and, and villains and all kinds of stuff. And yet we stick to this teeny little piece mm -hmm. of the story and never move on. I mean, how cool would it be if they would at least move on to something else that exists in the, in that whole long, long story. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And yet we have the same thing over and over just with different actors and, that but, that really irritates me as a Spider-Man fan. That that really that themselves, all right, and that, that's that's what that irritates me too. I'm mean, I totally in, uh, I totally agree with both of you, but uh, it sells every time they put it out. It sells. So I um, don't know why. I don't I either. Don't <laughs> they're not going to mess with it. as long as they keep selling. They're going to keep doing it. So we're going to yeah, start exactly. recopying these things so we can get something fresh out there. Yeah. yeah, I mean they they just will not take any risk as long as those things keep selling. People keep going to see them. You know, mm -hmm. people go and. Palooza, <laughs> yeah, quite. Jay. Exactly right, JD. Dead right. <laughs> as long as they keep, as long as people keep buying them, going to see them, yeah. etc., they'll just keep making them because it's easy money for them. You know, well, maybe that's what we should be doing. Then I should be writing the Sword of Shinar again, and you should be uh, writing Star Wars again. <laughs> yeah. A new hope. A new hopeless. You can write that one. I think I've already worked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just reading. Sorry, I said, yeah, there we yeah, go. Yeah, I was just going to bring up yeah. Margaret. Margaret says, to be fair, the Spider Verse movie was hella innovative. Jason Reynolds ripped it up. I'm not sure which one. I'll have to look that up. Uh, I, so, you know, I don't even watch them, so I have no idea who that is. I, yeah, I, so uh, yeah, I saw the Spider Verse one, and, and actually, that was like very good. They can like had all these different Spider Men from different, and and not only yeah. Spider Men, there was a, there's also, was it, uh, Gwen Stacy, she was spider girl, I don't know. Um, but they had all of these from different, kind of like the, the different sort of like Marvel universes, the different variations of Spider-Man. And that That's was actually like one of the most kind of like entertaining ones of those I've seen like in years, you know, it was like actually very well done, even though it was, you know, it was an animation kind of thing. It wasn't live action or anything like that. Uh, but it was like really well done, and the stories and and the storylines that they they included were like really quite good. And there was some really strange ones. There was like um, I don't know because I don't know all of the different sort of like timelines. Spider Gwen, yeah, thanks, Jay. Uh, and there was also one was um, Spider Pig or something. It was kind of like Porky Pig in a Spider Man unit uh, outfit, and it was kind of like what? I don't even like spiders. <laughs> You know, and it was like, yeah. but it was kind of like, yeah, wow, this is a bit different. You know, they're doing something with it, you know. Mm -hmm. That I don't have a problem with. It's just when they retell the mm -hmm. same thing over and over and over again. That's what I have the problem with. But yeah, that sounds that yeah. sounds fun and enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. Margaret Pernard did mention the movies that put me in the franchises are because they're funny. And uh, we, I had a discussion. I'm not sure who I was talking to uh, a little while ago about the Star Trek franchises. Not the, not the original Star Trek series, but when they came out with the movies. And someone said, oh, it was actually Tim Connolly. I had him on uh, one of my libraries on a Friday night. Uh, and he was telling me that Wrath of Khan is his favorite Star Trek movie. And I thought about it. And I'm thinking my favorite Star Trek movie, bar none, is Star Trek IV, uh, The Voyage Home, just because of the humor that they put into that movie. Mm. They, you know, they make Spock swear. And they, you know, it's not the swearing, but it's because of the characters actually doing it that makes it funny. Mm. And yeah. check off, and he gets caught by the at the naval base, and all the little humor that they put in that movie. I thought it was great. Yeah, those are those kinds of things are you know great. The Star Trek movies, they do do different things, and I like that a lot too. It's yeah, they're starting to do some, and some yeah. fall in the face, and some are great. So uh, yeah, yeah, nice. it is. It is kind of like that's right. That's very true. That's very yeah, true. Yeah, and the whales. Yeah, there'd be whales here. 
I can't <laughs> sound like Scotty at all. I'll have to get Caroline to come in here and do that for us. <laughs> so I'm just conscious of the time. Uh, Dave, thank you for uh, being with us this week, and uh, we'd love to have you back on again. Uh, we're, we're now booking into January next year. Uh, if you've got a new release coming up uh, sometime next year and you want to get back in here, uh, just uh, look us up and uh, we'll get you back and we'll talk about your new release. Thank you for coming on. Uh, so just before we leave you, though, uh, one, where can we find your books? And two, what is the next book that's coming out? Is it the Joe Ballon 4 or is it the Logan 2? Um, it'll be Joe Ballon 4 will be the next one. Uh, that should be coming out in probably about six weeks, something like that. Awesome. So there's no um, firm date yet? Sorry? No. You don't have a firm date yet for it? No, I, I avoid firm dates like a plague. <laughs> But if you're signed up to David's uh, newsletter, I believe that the uh, cover was released, right? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I saw that. The, yeah. Yeah, I announced the cover um, on my last newsletter at, at the weekend. Um, but uh, yeah, that will be the next one. It'll be about, as I said, next six weeks or so, I'm guessing. Uh, and then Logan will be later on in this, this year, I believe. Depends how it goes. <laughs> it depends. It depends on whether the, your your uh, biggest critic uh, finds fault with the series. Yeah, sure. it depends if I have to rewrite the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, where can we find your books if we're looking for them? Uh, you can find them on all sort of, of the major book retailers. You can find them there. Um, if you want kind of like more direct contact, you can go to my website, davidandkelly.net, and you can find out all the information about all the books, see the book trailers there, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Awesome. How about you, Christy? Uh, do you got something coming up in the next little while? I do. I finally have something to say at the end oh, of okay. one of these. So um, <laughs> this Friday, actually, May 28th at 8 p.m. Eastern time, I'm going to be doing another writer showcase interview, which I awesome. do every other month now. Um, and this one's going to be with Chris Humphreys. He's also known as C.C. Humphreys. Um, and he's also an actor. He's been in a number of um, TV shows and things like that. So it's going to be a lot of fun to talk to him he writes historical fiction and fantasy and he i think recently wrote a book that sort of plays off some 40s um noir style movies um, and i love those so uh i'm really excited to talk to him just Me make too. sure you go to um, facebook and writer showcase and that that page is where the live stream will be it's already pinned to the top so i hope you can join us it's going to be a lot of fun so that's what's coming up for me how about yeah. you richard yeah i'll pop in there i've got a live read again coming up on uh Friday, I've actually got a guest uh, coming on, a local author here in Cambridge, uh, Tara Shipley, Shipley. I'll never say her name right. Tara <laughs> Shipley Mondu. And uh, so we're going to be live reading from her book and then uh, live reading from uh, Keeper the Jewel, which is going to be releasing on June 15th. So I'm quite excited about that. And, and that's what's new with me going right now. I'm, uh, I'm in the process of editing a 600-page manuscript. So that's fulfilling my days and it'll do that for the next couple of weeks that's all i'm gonna do is sit on my couch and read not long enough richard read and yeah well I, you know what uh dragon sect is supposed to i want it to be shorter but it's it might be even longer so we'll see i guess i gotta stop this because it's cutting into a, my releases i tried to release three books a year and uh, this might make it turn it down to two but we'll see so anyway next week's guest uh will be canadian author con lavery writer of dark fantasy horror and thrillers and Khan is also a graphic designer by trade. That should be a good episode uh, speaking to him about his... Uh, mm -hmm. his uh, oh. He waited <laughs> until he looked away. It was very clever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, until then, Chris and I hope everyone has an amazing week. We hope you all stay safe. And we wish that you all take care. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. <laughs>